Martin Stickles came into the world on February 7, 1870, in Adams County, Iowa. However, his life took a significant turn when, at just 18 months old, he was uprooted to Washington as part of a family relocation. According to his mother, Martin was a fragile child from birth, prone to sudden fits of anger without apparent cause, and was regarded as unnatural. Information about his early life remained scant, but as the time of the murders approached, Stickles had transformed into a recluse, dwelling aboard a scow that traversed the waters of the Columbia, Cowlitz, and Cowie Man rivers. He eked out a livelihood as a fisherman during this solitary existence. The inaugural victim in this grim saga was William B. Shanklin, a solitary farmer and lifelong acquaintance of Stickles. The two had been neighbors for many years. Tragedy struck on November 22, 1899, when Shanklin was seated at his cabin's dinner table in Kelso, partaking in his evening meal. Martin, armed with a rifle, fired a fatal shot through the window, instantly ending Shanklin's life. In the aftermath, Stickles forcibly entered the residence, seizing any valuable possessions he could lay his hands on, ultimately setting the cabin ablaze in a desperate bid to conceal his actions. Despite the diligent efforts of local sheriffs to unravel the mystery and a $300 reward offered by Governor John Rankin Rogers, justice remained elusive. A different man, a weaver, initially faced trial for the murder, but was eventually released with allegations circulating that Stickles had attended the proceedings. Almost a year later, on November 28, 1900, Stickles embarked on a journey to Castle Rock. There, an elderly couple by the names of Cornelius Knapp and his wife resided. As they sat down for their evening meal, tragedy struck when a rifle shot pierced through their window, claiming both of their lives. Mirroring his previous modus operandi, Stickles ransacked the residence, making off with all valuable possessions, but refrained from setting it ablaze, unlike the prior case. Stickles found himself under intense scrutiny regarding the series of murders. He vehemently proclaimed his innocence during the initial interrogation, until investigators dropped a bombshell. They had identified a watch and some keys belonging to Shanklin. In the face of this evidence, Martin confessed to all three murders. However, he attempted to shift the blame onto a neighbor, Edward Pierce, portraying himself as a mere accomplice. According to Stickles, he had been lured by the promise of loot and played a role in planning the crimes, but distanced himself from the actual murders. This claim faced pushback from sheriffs, who were convinced there had been a lone gunman due to the discovery of a single set of footprints in the snow leading to one of the crime scenes. Furthermore, Pierce's alibi held firm, as he was confirmed to be on his scow in the Columbia River at the time of the murders. During his account of the crimes, Stickle displayed an unsettling indifference, occasionally punctuated by laughter, seemingly deriving perverse joy from recounting the horrors all while unaware of the contradictions in his narrative. While awaiting trial at Pierce County Jail in December, Stickles and his fellow prisoners received a visit from members of the Salvation Army. Touched by their sermons, he underwent a profound transformation, embracing the Christian faith. In a confession before the priests, Stickles admitted sole responsibility to all the murders. Surprisingly, he remained cheerful and declared his acceptance of whatever sentence the court would impose even if it meant facing the death penalty. When he stood before the Superior Court for his arraignment, Stickles pleaded not guilty. His lawyers and family argued for leniency, citing his unsound mental state and lifelong unnatural tendencies. However, after just an hour of deliberation, the jury found him guilty. Justice Miller handed down a death sentence. On January 25, 1901, Martin Stickles met his fate at the gallows. He delivered a brief speech to those in attendance, expressing his hope for acceptance in heaven by Jesus. The rope was placed around his neck, and the drop was released, leading to almost instantaneous death. However, a calculation error in the drop resulted in gruesome injuries, tearing flesh from Stickles' neck and causing blood to spurt. After a few tense moments, psychiatrists confirmed his death, and his body was handed over to his family for burial. During the final rites, observers noted the presence of a mysterious veiled woman who left shortly thereafter. It was later revealed that Stickles had promised her marriage through a newspaper ad. This botched execution became a prominent topic of discussion in an article detailing failed executions in Washington State. 
alongside that of wife murderer Richard Quinn in 1910.